Okay, well, first of all, I hereby introduce Aya Chanda, who will now introduce me. All right. So this is Ajahn Ram, who just introduced me. Yeah. And uh, it's very wonderful to have you here, Ajahn. It's a great joy and privilege, and uh, we've already had a lot of fun. And uh, it's lovely to see Ajahn in his home country, because I think you do enjoy even the drizzle, and you enjoy the accents up here you as well. So. <laughs> it's really very sweet. And um, yeah, Ajahn comes to support this project and uh, to spread the Dhamma. So uh, anyway, I think you should just begin. But what I want to point out too is, look, someone gave you your favourite flower. Oh, <laughs> good, yeah. Isn't that lovely? You know what this is? It's a microphone. Cauliflower. <laughs> 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 Where's Matthias? No, it's not. Is, is it on? I guess it's This on. one's on here. It's not a microphone, is it? No, it's not, Ajahn. Yeah. But you can, you can pretend it is. Can, yeah. It's a holy water stick. Okay. You dip it in your glass and then... <laughs> yeah, we, we mess about. Anyway, but now it's actually time this to start to, the retreat. It's close to my favourite flower. Yeah. Because my dad was from Liverpool. He had asthma. <laughs> and so I did have hay fever. So flowers can sometimes make oh, yeah, me sneezy. Right. They're will okay. It? Will it? But I always say my favourite flower uh, doesn't make me sneezy at all. My favourite flower is cauliflower. It's a flower, cauliflower. So even at my shrine over in Perth, one day they put the shrine up, a big shrine with lots and lots of cauliflower. The flowers to worship the Buddha. <laughs> And I think you find out by now that serious monks and serious nuns, we all have a good sense of humour. In other words, if you do too serious, too stiff, then your mind is just not open, not soft enough to get nice meditation. It's one of the reasons why it is very good to have noble silence. When you have noble silence, if anybody breaks a noble silence, uh, you have my full permission to give them the one finger sign. You know the one finger sign? <laughs> That's the one finger sign. And also to make sure that you do keep noble silence. A noble silence means no bells. And if you don't ring any bells, then some people actually win the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> That's why I call it Nobel Silence. <laughs> and now, those are the sorts of standards of jokes you can expect <laughs> on this retreat. <laughs> so if you want to leave now, <laughs> please do. But also, just in order to find some peace in your mind, peace in your heart, uh, this is how we learn how to meditate with a soft mind. And I think many of you, I noticed many of you, some of you spent the last three or four months with me over in uh, Perth. Love you. Nice to see you. And, oh, sorry? Last year, not this year. Last year, not that long ago anyway. <laughs> and it's nice to see many of you again. And so I think a lot of you know my teachings, roughly, about uh, making kindfulness more important than mindfulness. Many of you uh, may have practiced mindfulness. Of course, having been a monk now, uh, 49 range retreat as a monk now, 49 years. It's a long time. But you know that in these days we have mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapies and goodness knows what else. If I went to the United States, I would not be allowed to teach. I haven't done the exams or the <laughs> authorizations, <laughs> which sometimes it gets a bit ridiculous. But please know that I've been a monk for such a long time, well sort of respected, 
So well respected. Can I tell that story? It's up to you. You've got half now. About just coming here, just walking down the road in Sheffield, and this guy doing the roadworks in one of the bulldozers. He stopped and he said, you know, you are the spitting image of Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> There's a good reason for that. I am Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> so he follows me on YouTube and he was so surprised. Imagine that someone who follows you on YouTube, they're in Sheffield and they see me walking down their past their bulldozer. He was really shocked. So he got out of his bulldozer, we took some photos. He was day. like this, yeah. on the photo. <laughs> I kind of like that. <laughs> surprising people. But anyhow, so I've got a good reputation, so please be trusting that if you practice kindfulness, it's far more powerful to get into some nice deep meditation than, than if you just do mindfulness. It's okay being aware, but can you maintain mindfulness that easy? A lot of times your mind wanders off. Why? Because it's no fun. Sometimes if you sit down and meditate, now, how long can you, can you meditate for? Sometimes people say 40 minutes or half an hour is your maximum. How long can you watch a football match for on the TV? <laughs> how much long can you watch a movie on the TV? How long are movies now? Hour and a half or two hours? Two hours? You can watch a movie without your mind wandering off. How come you can't watch something inside without your mind wandering off? The main reason is because when you're watching a movie, it's interesting, it's fun, it's satisfying. That's why the mind never goes anywhere. It stays put. So we want to try and do the same thing to make sure that your mind stays put, doesn't go anywhere. Because you're enjoying it. It's fascinating watching the mind. So I'm going to start with one of the powerful teachings about mindfulness and kindness about uh, something, those of you who've heard this before, I apologise, but please know that I've heard it more times than you have. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, you know, the story of the Emperor's Three Questions. This is not in a Buddhist book, it was in a book by Leo Tolstoy, of um, some questions, some sort of talks which he, uh, articles rather, short stories which he collected uh, to raise support from the Jewish community in Imperial Russia at the time. We're not being given sort of a fair chance. So anyway, the story which he wrote was the Emperor's Three Questions. I was inspired by it when I first read it. And then also later on in, in my monastic life, you turned that into a legitimate meditation technique, which was powerful. And the Emperor's Three Questions were the questions, when is the most important time? When is the most important time? No. You're supposed to be silent. <laughs> You're supposed to be wrong. <laughs> yes, now you can speak. Now. And the next question, who is the most important person? If you've heard it before, be quiet. <laughs> this was really shocked me. Who is the most important person? That's much better. You said me first of all. Thank you for, for getting it wrong first. Most people will say that you are the most important person or some big leader or big shot. But the most important person is the one right in front of you. So you, madam, the most important person in the world to me right now. For not for long. <laughs> now you are. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, that the one right in front of you is the most important person. I remember when I read that, I was just a hairy student. <laughs> I was hairy, believe it or not. When I was young, I used to have big curly hair, which went all the way around to here, and that's when my beard started. It went all the way around. It was very efficient if you lived in London, which was cold. I never needed hats or scarves. <laughs> I had my own insulation. <laughs> but, Every time you went to ask a question from one of the lecturers at university, 
or a question from anybody you met on the road. They always wanted to get rid of you. They would never allow the conversation to continue because I wasn't important to them, a small fellow. And I thought that was just very uh, discriminating and off-putting and offensive. I had a legitimate question to ask and the person I was asking it from didn't have time to listen to me and was trying to get rid of me all the time. Now I am a teacher, quite well known, even by uh, bulldozer drivers. <laughs> if ever they stop to ask a question, I would always stop. They become the most important person in the world for me at that time. I recognize them, respect them. And that means you can communicate with them. Otherwise, it's a very lonely, um, off-putting world. And it's a beautiful thing to do. Whatever uh, job you are in in your life, if somebody comes to ask you a question, no matter who it is, please give them importance. They're a human being too. You don't know who they may be. But for you in that moment, make sure they feel that they are the most important person in the world to you. Now that sometimes happens with those of you who have children. When you have children, mummy, 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 oh, later darling, I've got to do the dinner. Daddy, 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 oh no, I haven't got time in the moment, just ask me later on. Has ever anything like that happened to you when you were kids? It's terrible for a child to be treated that way. It's like, I am your son, I'm your daughter, but I'm not important to you. There was this story of this kid who was waiting for his daddy to come home from work. He was only maybe six or seven years of age, and as soon as his daddy came in from work late, he said, Daddy, Daddy, how much do you earn at work? And daddy said, none of your business, son. What does a six-year-old need to know about that for? Shut up. And he just tried to go into the kitchen to get a cup of tea. And the kid said, but daddy, 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 how many dollars do you earn at work? I already told you, no, it's none of your business. But daddy, how many dollars per hour do you earn at work? Third time, son, I warned you, get up to your room, you're grounded. He got angry at his son. And son went up to his room and the father felt afterwards he'd been very cruel to his son. He was only asking a simple question, but he was just tired. Do you feel like that sometimes when you're tired, you're exhausted, you've got a short temper? So he went up to his kid's room and just knocked on the door, let himself in and said, look son, I don't know why you want to know as a six-year-old how much I earn at work. But I earn $20 an hour. Thank you, daddy, said the little son. Now, can I borrow 10 bucks, please? <laughs> <laughs> and straight away, the father was, no, but then he thought, I've already shouted at my son once, I'm not going to shout twice. So he reached into his wallet and took out a $10 note and gave it to his six-year-old son. Thank you so much, Daddy. And then the son reached into the drawer next to his bed and took out another $10 in coins and presented $20 to his father and said, now daddy, can I please have one hour of your time? I don't know if you've heard that story before, but I remember telling that over in Indonesia in a radio station. And the person interviewing me was a Muslim. She was a single mother and she started crying. She had a single mother, she was a single mother, she was working so hard to try and get her kids a good education. And she didn't realize what the kids wanted was to be with her mother, their mother, more than any other education. So she, she was crying her eyes out afterwards. She loved that story. I'll never forget that reaction. What's most important? If someone's right in front of you, especially if it's your kid, or even your husband, your wife, your parent, don't take them for granted. If they're right in front of you and ask a question, they become the most important person in the whole world. 
and that's called communication, respect. Okay, and the next thing, what's the most important thing to do? Be generous and give lots of donations to Anna Kampa? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the most important thing, it's a beautiful answer. Uh, to care, yeah. I think you all you know the stories. But they're beautiful stories, is to care. This was the story recently, the result of this little story was uh, Venerable Chanda was staying uh, in Perth and, and she started getting you know, all sorts of troubles with her guts and she needed, a doctor suggested to get an a endoscopy. You know how hard it is to get an endoscopy in England on the NHS? You have to wait till you're dead first before they'll do it. <laughs> close. And it was going to be the same over in Australia. But there was this one gentleman I knew very well, the story of him, that you know, he was one of these little fellows who used to come to the monastery when he was at school, at the Dharma, Dharma school, and he grew up you know, with me. And he came to see me at a meditation class and said, Ajahn Brahm, you know I'm a doctor physician in one of the hospitals, I have to resign. Resign. It's so much hard work, you know, qualifying as a doctor. Why on earth are you resigning? And he said something terrible happened that morning. One of his patients, a young woman, started going through the dying process much quicker than anyone uh, expected. And he was a doctor on duty. He tried to heal her, find out what was wrong, save her life, but he couldn't do it. She died on his watch. And that's bad enough, but then because he was a doctor at the time, he had to be the one to tell her husband that the young woman you've married, only for a couple of years, she's no more, she's died. And that was an incredible shock for this young man. But then he also had to tell the two young kids as well, you've got no mummy anymore. And he had to do that. He said, that hurts so badly. It's like having a, a knife twisted three times in his heart. And it hurts. He was a sensitive man. And he said, look, that will happen again, I'm sure. I don't think I can face that again. And so he wanted to resign. And that's when I told him, you've mistaken the point about being a doctor, being a nurse, being a counsellor, being a therapist, a psychologist, psychiatrist, whoever you are. The point is not to cure people. Your main purpose in life as a doctor working in a hospital is not to cure people, but to care for them. Make caring your number one priority. You never need to fail if you care for people. You can always do that. <coughs> Curing them, sometimes you will fail. But imagine that they know, they get friends and relations know they've been cared for so much. It takes away so much of the sting of death. You've cared for them as much as you can. And he got the message. He went back to work that afternoon. <laughs> and he eventually specialised in things like colonoscopy and endoscopy. So whenever there's an emergency and I need some, some a bit of advancement on the schedule of the, the health service in Australia, I give him a call. He's got so much gratitude. He said, oh yeah, I'll sort that out. How long do you have to wait? Five days. Five days? <laughs> That's not National Health Service, that's Gratitude Health Service. To be able to sort of squeeze somebody in. Because you know, if you didn't care for them, they would never be able to care for anybody. So anyway, that's what happens with caring. I'm not quite sure what you do in your life, what your profession is. You can always fail in medicine, in anything, but please, 
care and you never need to feel a failure in life. You can create so much beauty and happiness in this world. That's why caring is so important for me. Always remember that the one in front of you, the most important person in the world, right now is the most important time and the only thing to do is to care. Care is this is connection between a middle, between mindfulness and kindness. And it's incredibly powerful. It works on other people in your job. Imagine how much it would work in your relationship to yourself, to your own heart, mind and body. Care for it. A lot of times it's more powerful than curing things. There's many, many stories, but the latest story, which I love to tell, I doubt if you've heard it, because it was only a couple of months ago. During the range retreat, while I was eating, somebody told a joke and I laughed. I should never do that, <laughs> laughing and eating at the same time. <laughs> and there was a bit of food still in my throat and it went, I don't know what it did, but it got stuck, stuck in the esophagus. So I couldn't swallow anymore. I couldn't even drink. The esophagus was blocked. So what do you do as a monk when your esophagus is blocked? I could still breathe and could still speak. So it wasn't that bad, just really a bit uncomfortable. So instead of, I hate, please excuse me if there's any doctors here. Going to doctors, all they ever do when if my monks go there, they do tests. Another test, another test. I went to university, I've had it with tests. <laughs> and also, being a forest monk, sometimes you live so far away from the nearest um, doctor, that sometimes you learn how to deal with these things yourself. And you, there you learn amazing tricks about how to use this meditation for good health. And that's when I decided, instead of just fighting it or getting worried, to relax as much as I possibly could. Go back to a cave in which I live, go back there, and instead of exercise or taking medication or calling a doctor, just relaxing as much as I possibly could, meditating. I never realize exactly how this works, but my imagination is that when you relax, all your muscles get very loose and very soft. So that would have been what happened in my esophagus. All the muscles there got very loose and relaxed, and the food which was stuck there could come out. And I knew it was a power of meditation because one thing which happens when you have meditation uh, success, that whatever you taste, whatever you see, whatever you smell, whatever you hear, whatever you feel, becomes more delightful than ever before. And I still remember just once the, the throat cleared and I could drink water, the first glass of water which I swallowed down the whole lot, it was so sweet, the water. It was ordinary water, just as I would always drink, but it tasted so cool and so sweet and delicious. It's something which happens with meditation. The more calm and peaceful you get, the senses like get cleaned and you can see beauty where you've never seen beauty before. Even smells become far more fragrant. Sounds become delicious and even food. I remember this, the first retreat I went to, the food was so delicious. That retreat was in a boarding house, three boarding houses we hired uh, in Cambridge. Now, in the colleges, they had real chefs. In the boarding houses, it was just landladies doing the cooking. And you know, even good chefs, this was UK, not Italy, not France. The, the chefs were well known for the, their skills in cooking. They'd boil everything or steam it until there was no taste left. Doesn't matter what you ate, it all tasted the same. But this time, every day, the food was absolutely delicious. And I couldn't figure that out at first. 
Is it that we were just lucky our good karma, we managed to get chefs who, or boarding house cooks who could actually cook? It was nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with the fact that my mind was very peaceful, my senses were enhanced. And so when I say cook or ate a carrot, yes, that carrot had been boiled to death, but nevertheless, the small remnant of flavor left. <laughs> I could pick that all up straight away and it was delicious. <laughs> That's one of the things which happens in meditation. Whatever you see, whatever you taste, whatever you feel, becomes more and more delightful. And it's, you, can, you can do incredible things with your health. So anyhow, that's what happens with the kindness. So you have this combination of mindfulness with kindness, called kindfulness. It's a much more powerful word, kindfulness. So when you're aware, you're aware of this beautiful softness. So when I start the meditation, the guided meditations, as many of you know, you start with a sweep of the body. It's amazing just how many people even in a country like UK, are just so unaware of many of the things which happen in your body. You just don't know what's going on there. You don't look. One of the things which I have done is you know, taught in cancer centres. And there's a major cancer centre over in Perth, Western Australia, I've been teaching there every year for the last, I think, 36 years. And when they had this big opening ceremony for this huge campus spoke, sponsored by the government, and then they asked two people to be the VIPs to open the place. One of them was the Premier, the head of Western Australia. The other one was me. There was no archbishops or wealthy people there, just this poor old monk and this powerful um, premier of the state. And I asked them, why me? And they said, because all these years, what I've been doing and serving actually works. And they just wanted to say thank you. And how it started working was this is one woman, the first time I went there, <coughs> She said she was re recovering from breast cancer. She had to have surgery. It was traumatic. I don't know how many of you have had breast uh, cancer. It's devastating for you. Painful and psychologically traumatic. She pulled through. She went into remission. But her question to me was, it was so painful going through that cancer. I'm so happy I got through it, but if it came back again, I don't think I could stand it. What should I do if it comes back again? And my question, it wasn't just a joke, it was powerful. Sometimes people underestimate some of these funny responses. The answer was, what would happen if it didn't come back? And that really shocked her, that someone would say that. But that's exactly the answer she needed. So she kept coming back every year when I came, and the cancer never came back. You can imagine the psychology of that. If you're worried it's going to come back, you're having so much negativity in your mind, you're increasing the likelihood that it's going to come back. You think, what happened if it didn't come back? That positive attitude relaxes her enough that she can live a beautiful life. And for her, it never came back, but she was influential, so she got me invited as a VIP. So, this is the kind of wisdom you have with a kindness. And it's not just that type of kindness with wisdom, it's also being able to know your body and relax it all. It's amazing just the power you have over your body, but you don't make use of it the power you have just to feel part. Right now, what part of your body is aching 
or hurting more than anything else. How your, how's your stomach? How's your, your legs? How's your head feel right now? If you can pick up the part of your body which is aching and hurting the most, and instead of trying to avoid it and go somewhere else where the ache or the pain isn't, just go right into it. Even Ajahn Chah, he was my teacher, he told me how he overcame malaria. It was called like the forest monk's disease in that, those years. You know, everybody got it. So the malaria fevers were very intense. But one day he had a malaria fever and he got so basically fed up with it. That's the best word you can say, just fed up with it. So he decided instead of trying to take some medication or just to do anything with it, he would just stay there and go right inside of it. And that's how he described it. He went right inside this like burning fire of the fever. And it was like that he was in the middle of a forest which was burning and burning, so uh, more and more hot. It became so hot, he was like in the middle. He wasn't being burnt, but he could feel the heat. And it got so intense that then it exploded. And then the fever was gone. He never got fever again. You know, you hear all these stories and you want to share them to take away people's physical suffering. It does actually work sometimes. You've got to have the ability to have that confidence. A simple uh, thing like a cancer or a fever, go right inside of it. It doesn't ever sort of take off. So anyway, that's what he did. And so what that meant was that with the kindness, it has power in so many different areas, with your body, your health, and then of course with your mind. So how you actually do it, now first of all, I always do this body relaxation first of all before I start meditating, just to check up that my body is all okay. And when you do really relax, you, know, you find an important part of meditation is something which I call the delight of, of a relaxation. You're not doing anything to your body, you're just relaxing it to the max, and it feels really good. It feels pleasurable. And I say that because you don't want anybody to uh, avoid or be afraid of the pleasures which come from doing beautiful things like just relaxation, making everything loose and easy. And it also has incredible health benefits. But then once my body is relaxed, you can sit in a chair, you can sit on the floor. The posture, the most ridiculous posture I ever had to get into the deepest of meditations was when the first year in Thailand, I got scrub typhus fever. It's like the same symptoms of typhoid. Little mites in the forest would bite you. You could hardly see them and they would infect you. Locals were all immune. So it's only the Westerners who got this disease. And of course they didn't know what it was, that they didn't know how to treat it. So it's in the monk's ward of the local hospital. This was a third world part of a third world country in the northeast of Thailand. And I don't know that you may think that all the Thai girls are nice and petite and beautiful. The nurse who looked after me in the monk's ward looked more like a, a water buffalo than a lady. And she was the one who had to inject you, and once in the morning, once in the afternoon, with a cocktail of, of um, antibiotics, hoping that one would fit. She never injected me, <laughs> stabbed me in the butt <coughs> twice a day. And after about a week of that, oh, your butt was so sore. It was. And even though I'm supposed to do loving kindness meditation to all beings, I did make an exception for her. <laughs> no way I could give loving kindness to that brute of a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I 
and nothing worked. For three weeks, she still had really heavy fever, absolutely lowest energy. I was only about 23, 24 at the time. So you should, should be a fit young man. But instead, I was just really just dull and energyless. But then I decided one day, I don't know why I did this, I'm obviously very glad I did, instead of complaining, just to meditate instead. There's no way I could cross my legs and sit with a straight back. I had no energy to do that. Just where I was lying, I closed my eyes and started, in those days, was like letting go and breath meditation. Not doing anything. Relaxing to the max. That's what I... If I'd have known better, I'd have called it the Empress Three Question. Now is the only time you have. And the present moment, it feels awful. There's a fever and exhaustion, tiredness. It feels terrible. But that was really important to me for some reason. I was just kind to it. Totally kind to this feeling of being really, really sick. And then what happened? You went into this deep meditation. You know, you couldn't feel the body anymore, it vanished. And that was so beautiful to escape from the body, but just with really lots of mindfulness in the mind. And very happy. And when I came out afterwards, the first thing I looked at, I must admit, was my posture. I've never seen that posture in any book whatsoever. <laughs> One leg was this way, another leg was that way, and I'm over here. and. Because you're in a fever, you've seen maybe your friends in hospital and they're just trying to squirm around, trying to find a comfortable position. So my posture was all over the place, but still got into incredibly good meditation. From that experience, I can tell people with, with accuracy, your posture is not important. As long as your body is comfortable. So to have kindfulness to the body, you ask your body, how are you, body? Do your legs need to be moved? Is your back okay? Do you want to lean further back or lean further forward, lean to the left, the right? We always close our eyes in meditation, so if you need to scratch something, you'll be afraid to scratch if a camera was on you. <laughs> <laughs> You can scratch it. In other words, be kind to the body to make the body nice and comfortable. And then after the body is comfortable, you do the same to your mind. What do I mean by the mind? Right now, in this moment, if you're happy, you know, more happy than sort of suffering, put up your right hand. If you are not enjoying this, put up your left hand. Keep it up. Now, with one of the fingers of your hand, please point to that happiness for me. Point to it. Are you just imagining this? <laughs> happiness is real. Why can't you point to it? The reason is because happiness, sadness, anger, love, uh, anxiety, it doesn't live in the body, it lives in the mind. It's just kind of proving to you the mind actually exists, but has made up of these emotional qualities. So now you start looking at your mind. When the body is nicely relaxed, how does your mind feel? If it feels really peaceful and happy, how peaceful, how happy? You get to be aware. You don't judge, you just know how happy you feel. It's usually very, very happy because you've got fewer burdens to do. How busy are you in your life? In meditation, you've got nothing to do. Freedom. All I need to do is just be in the present moment, just to be here. Nothing to do in the whole world. If you do that, then if you care for what you're experiencing, it always becomes very pleasant, surprisingly so. So you just sit here, being in this moment, not really wanting to go anywhere, enjoying it to the max. That's where you become still. 
just like watching the TV show or the sport on the TV. You can watch it for hours because it's enjoyable. And once it's enjoyable, you don't need to do very much, which means it gets more enjoyable. You get more and more still, more and more peaceful. And then the joy just really starts taking off. Now sometimes people say, I just came here just for some ordinary meditation. As if you think you can't do all these deep meditations. And my answer will always be to you, yes you can. I love it when lay men and lay women come up to me after the, the meditation and tell me all these incredible experiences they had. If I say you can, it gives you confidence. And then you do it. I was a lay person when I got my first deep meditation, just a student. And look, it does change your life. Meditate, okay, yeah. One thing before we actually start meditating. But I've got to be sort of honourable and straight up for you. There is a danger there. People say, what's the danger of meditation? If you really get into the meditation, and you get the deep meditation, the biggest danger is you'll lose your hair. <laughs> That's what happened to me. I had lots of hair before. <laughs> So anyway, that's just an introduction to the meditation, the mindfulness, the kindfulness, and especially now is the only time you have. The most important thing to do is to care, and the most important thing to watch is the one which is right in front of you right now. Okay, so before I actually do start in one minute's time, please everybody stand up and have a good stretch. Five to, yeah, sure. Five minutes long. Over in Thailand and Laos, they call old monks, old people, old men, or oi. And old ladies, mer oi. You know why? Because when they get up, they go, oi. <laughs> oi. That's actually true. Okay, is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so what I usually do is to lead the first couple of minutes, or first maybe 10 minutes of the meditation, and then be quiet. Excellent. It's quite okay to lay down as long as you don't snore. Promise? Okay, very good. Nice good kick. <laughs> I shouldn't say things like that. Okay, so relax and get yourself nice and peaceful. And that's the first task to do, sitting in a chair. Make sure you're as comfortable as you can possibly make it. And when you think you're comfortable, think again. This time be a bit more precise. How are your feet now? How do they feel? Sitting in a chair, I usually like to just check my feet sometimes push them further away from the chair, sometimes tuck them in, sometimes move them apart, till I find they're the most comfortable I can make them. I feel those feet. And it's amazing, the longer you stay with your feet, the more sensitive you become to them. Now I can just look at any of the toes 
and relax them. And they do start to change their feelings. Mindfulness allows you to get feedback. You can see how the feelings in your toes change. If they're getting more tense, you're going in the wrong direction. So relax them. Often it's by trial and error until you learn how to relax them. Then you go to the, the main part of your feet, the sole of the feet, the uppers, the heel. How do the heels feel? And eventually, you can learn to relax what you thought was never able to be relaxed. You find what works is the mindfulness together with the kindness. Kindness makes things feel safe. So they do relax. And then from the feet, I go past my ankles. Because I don't play sport. It's not because I'm too old to play sport, but too kind to play sport. I never want to win and disappoint others. So I have very few injuries there. I go up my calves and my legs, experience their feelings. And sometimes with my calves, calf muscles right now, I'm imagining expanding them making them wider and larger and longer. So I'm not squashing them. And that makes them feel more relaxed. And I go to my knees. When I get to my knees, I, I get to know my knees and how, how they feel. And I also learn how to relax them. So nothing is held tight. It opens up all these beautiful avenues of energy, of healing energy. So if anything is amiss there, I can send these beautiful energies to my knees and relax a whole lot. And then I go past the knees to my thighs. Relaxing them as much as I possibly can. Relaxing to the max. And then to my butt. Your butt is sitting on a chair. It's pressure, squashing some of those muscles. But I do know when I make my... Uh, buttocks as comfortable as they possibly can, even though there's still a feeling there which will stay, the feeling doesn't change and it will soon go away all by itself. I will soon not be aware of that pressure of the bottom muscles against the chair. I can leave it. It's as comfortable as I can get it. And I go to my back, first of all the waist, I just like, I've just been my habit for years of always sitting up straight, which I'm going to do now. It kind of feels better, for me anyway. So my back is not supported by the backrest of the chair. It's self-supporting. But to me it feels better. And then I go up my body I kind of like doing like a scan, like a sweeping of the body from the bottom going upwards, upwards, upwards. And this is where, whether it's in my intestines or bowels, if it's in a liver or kidney or stomach, I can actually feel you know, how it is there. 
What do my intestines feel like now? As I sweep my attention up, if there's some place which needs extra attention, I will pause. I would imagine my mind going right into that. Not running away, but going right into it. Getting to feel and know it first of all. And then giving it this beautiful kindness. Even imagining any tightness, tension, is getting less and less and less. And sometimes you've done this even though you've had food poisoning. You can, you can meditate just all the spasms away. And then you eventually get through all your organs to your shoulders. And I like, there's a reason for this, which I'll let you know about in a moment. I always like scrunching up my shoulders, making them as tight as possible really tight, and then letting go. And my shoulders go to a place which is more relaxed than when I started. This is an effective way to relax those muscles. But it's also, it shows you what letting go is. Something which was stretched or squashed, and now you release that pressure and it goes back to its natural, safe, comfortable position. That's what letting go is like. Letting go of the pressures. And then I go down my arms, past my elbows and forearms to my hands. And again, strangely, I meditate so much, I so often get my hands in the wrong position. So I ask my hands just now, how are you? And they say, terrible. So I now adjust my fingers in my hand. And it, it feels better. And I go up to my shoulders and neck. You may notice that you can have aches in your back or neck simply because the head is not properly balanced on top of the neck. So at this point I usually move my head slowly from side to side, forward and back, until my head feels as comfortable as it could possibly be. The best balance on top of the neck. And lastly, to relax my, my body, I mindfully become aware of the muscles around my eyes, my mouth and my nose. I get to know those muscles and how they feel. And if they are anxious or afraid, your face has a different configuration. And you can feel that in the muscle tightness in your face. So by now I'm pretty alert to the muscles around my face. So I relax them all. I love relaxing the muscles around the eyes. Because when they get loose, it's as if I'm really at ease. And around the mouth and the nose. So everything is as relaxed as I possibly can make it. And then when I finish that job of relaxing the muscles in the face, then I usually ask to become aware of my whole body sitting here, all joined together. And again, honestly, my body feels really relaxed thanks to that deliberate part-by-part part relaxation of my body. And because it feels relaxed, as soon I can be aware of the delight of relaxation. It always accompanies relaxation, 
But for many years I just ignored the feeling of delight, the happy, joyful feeling. Just now I'm aware of it. And I focus on that delight of relaxation. And the relaxation goes deeper. That's why I love practicing and teaching this. It's an easy way to get even more relaxed all over your body and inside your body. And also you're turning even more exclusively to the world of the mind. And now in particular, now is the most important time. Whatever you are aware of right now, whatever this is, it's the most important object in the whole world. And your job, the only thing to do, is to care and be kind. Opening the door of your heart to whatever appears in this moment. That's as much instruction as I'm, I'm going to give. There's another 20 minutes left for you to meditate quietly by yourself.
How do you feel right now? Coming close to the end of the meditation. How peaceful are you? How relaxed? How aware? It's also time to check out what happened and why. This is how we learn about meditation and how to meditate. In a few moments, I will ask you to open your eyes. Do it slowly and gently come out from the meditation. Please open your eyes now. That's good. Now the next five minutes, I'm just going to ask this to give some simple instructions about the walking meditation because um, little Chandra and I are going to go out for lunch and we invite you to do the walking meditation, if you wish. And the walking meditation in the rooms upstairs. Okay, yeah. So we're doing walking meditation. It's very similar to what you've already just been doing. Only this time you stand you put your hands in front, behind, or wherever they're comfortable. Put your gaze, keep your eyes open. We don't want you to walk off the verandas and fall down the stairs. We want you to be safe and not hit your head against a wall. So keep your eyes open. And then you start walking naturally. After a while, to see if you can keep your attention just on the walking and the feet. So the first foot, say maybe the right foot, lifts up right now. Not looking at your feet, can you lift your right foot up right now? Feel it. Now put it down. To do that you have to be mindful of your feet. But when you do it in walking meditation, you're aware of your right foot lifting up when you go on the first step, does it go straight up? Or like most people, you lift it up and it goes back a bit. And then as you step forward, it goes in an arc forward. And then when you put it down on the floor, it goes, my foot goes straight down. See if you can find out what part of your foot meets the floor first. That's how much the mindfulness should be. And when it meets the floor, then the foot balances. You will move your weight onto that foot, which has just moved forward. And then you can feel your left foot and feel it rise up, go forward, and then go down. You completed one left step, one right step. So you don't look to your left or look to the right. I advise you not to be aware of your breathing, but be aware of your walking. That's the most important thing happening right now. And just be kind. Relax your body as you're walking. When you reach the end of the walking meditation path, then you turn around slowly and walk back again. You'll find because your awareness is focused just on your legs and your feet, it becomes very peaceful and very delightful. Walk as fast or as slow as you wish. Usually, the slow walking dominates because it's uh, enough going on there. And because you are getting more and more quiet and mindful, you can pick up much more what it's like to lift a foot up, move it forward and put it down again. What it's like to walk. 
and it also gives you the opportunity to do something other than just sitting down. You wake up, you don't get so sort of dull when you walk in meditation. And after a while, when you want to sit down again, you sit down again to meditate. It continues the meditation on from sitting to walking to sitting, thereby building up your, your uh, peace, your kindness, and your uh, silence in the mind. Okay, how's that? So I just want to add as well, so there's two rooms upstairs. If we can ask if you could use the short, so the rectangular room, oh, yeah. the shorter distance to walk, maximise the space in the rooms. And upstairs in the tea and coffee area, there is a bit of space there to use. Yeah. I was going to ask if you could please put the chairs to the edge of that room, just clear the middle part, and then there's a lot more space. Please just use in here for sitting meditation. Okay. So uh, you can just kindly let us both leave the room first. We've got our lunch uh, deadline, and at 12 o'clock we turn into pumpkins or something. That's what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, enjoy your walking and also the lunch. It's also a practice in uh, caring for every morsel and uh, being mindful of your eating. That'll t make it taste nice as well. So we'll see you back in here at uh, about five to one. And I will ring a bell as well. So at uh, quarter to two, I'll ring a bell. And again, about seven minutes, the uh, one that I'll ring a bell. Okay. You can cut all this. Okay. Your health. <laughs>